our economy really is determined in many ways by the amount of inflation and the amount of growth, by the interest rates that the central bank used to regulate all of this. And uh, if you get it wrong, you can get into big trouble. Silicon Valley Bank, for example, uh, during COVID and prior to that, they bought a lot of long governmental bonds, believing that they're in a recession, because usually that's the right thing to buy if you're in a recession. Uh, but a few years later, it actually turned out that we are more in a stockflation or even overheating kind of economy. Interest rates went up and the value of the bond they bought, the bond ended up plummeting. And that essentially caused uh, Silicon Valley Bank to ultimately have to declare bankruptcy. So getting these things wrong can be very, very costly. Uh, and I think the things that Silicon Valley Bank got very wrong was uh, buying these bonds with the expectations that they can appreciate. Throughout this last decade, our interest rate has already been so low, so they really couldn't go any lower. So there wasn't much upside potential. And all it took is for inflation, structural inflation to come, and the banks went bankrupt. So uh, the lessons that ought to be learned here is that if you know where you are, and if you know where you're heading, uh, you can really do very well uh, or you can do very poorly if you don't understand these things. How do we know where we are now and where we are heading? Monetary policy in general, you know, is something that's not that hard uh, on a big picture point of view. The key thing to understand is so that says inflation, which means prices are going up, and says growth, which is a proxy for unemployment. You have central banks, which essentially need to balance these things so as to keep inflation to, say, around 2%, which is what the target is, and to keep growth as high as possible and unemployment uh, relatively low. Um, to keep things simple, growth and unemployment, they kind of go together. If you have high growth, it is assumed that unemployment will be low. So then it really becomes a matter of balancing how much growth you have and how much inflation you have. And if you put these things on a chart, you get four quadrants, where if you top left of that chart, you will have high growth and you have low inflation. And that's really where everybody would want to be. In an environment like this, Stocks will do very well. Real estate tends to do very well. And the reason they do well is because your cost of financing is not that high. Uh, people are making quite a bit of money. The economy is thriving. Earnings of companies are doing well. Uh, that in turn means that salaries, people have money and they're going to buy a bigger house, which they can buy with relatively low uh, mortgages. So that drives everything forward. And then you have another scenario where your growth isn't doing so well. And that's when typically you end up in a recession, meaning your inflation is not that high, your growth is not that good. And the central banks will come in and will say, we need to lower our interest rates in order to promote growth. We need to make money cheap so people spend more. So that's usually what happens in a recession. And because of that, it's usually a good idea to buy long-term governmental bonds. And the reason is long-term governmental bonds tend to increase in value, or other long-term bonds for that matter, when interest rates fall. And usually it's a safe bet to say that if you're in a recession, central banks would lower interest rates and that will cause your, your bonds to appreciate. Another thing which can be good to buy is gold, because being a defensive sort of asset, uh, and there are certain stocks, defensive stock, which tend to do pretty well in those areas. Uh, McDonald's being an example. Um, then if you go towards the bottom right, um, you have stagflation. Stagflation is a period which usually is seen as the worst of all worlds. That's when you have a high inflation and your growth isn't doing so well. We had a prolonged period of stagflation in the 1970s, for example. And during these periods, stocks uh, don't do well because earnings are not going to be very good. Your cost of financing are going to be high because central banks are forced to push up the price of money, the cost of money to keep inflation at bay. So it's really the worst of all 
worlds. Um, bankruptcy is people are going to be let go of their jobs. They don't have some money to pay so expensive car as a house and it kind of compounds. So during these pe periods, uh, gold and precious metals are usually at their best. And then the last quadrant is the top right. And that's when you have uh, inflation being quite high, uh, but you also have good growth. And during some time you have an overheating kind of scenario. And that's when central banks have to start raising interest rates in order to reduce prices from appreciating too fast. And keep in mind that inflation really is a matter of how much money is chasing a limited amount of goods. So you can have high inflation or heating economy uh, if you don't have enough goods happen, coming, uh, coming on board. So if we correlate how gold is doing with these different quadrants, you can actually see some very interesting relationships. Uh, if we look at this chart starting from uh, 1970 or so, and you look at the performance of gold, you will see that between 1970 and 1981, we have a stagflationary period. So high inflation, which means we are mostly in either an overheating or stagflationary quadrant. And throughout this period, stocks uh, won't be performing so well. Um, gold will be doing very, very well. And gold did do very well. It had an average increase of 26% per year from uh, 1970 going to 1981. So. By 1981, 1982, Paul Volkmer, uh, which was a Fed chairman at that time, uh, ended up increasing interest rates as much as 20% in order to get inflation down. And he managed to do so. Uh, it caused a major recession, but he restored the trust in the United States dollar. And that really ushered in a period between 1981 to around 2007, when we had a pretty stable growth. Uh, interest rate were sort of going back and forth in order to keep inflation at an average of 3.7%. 3 growth was quite good. And so we were moving between good growth, overheating and recession. Um, and overall throughout this period, gold didn't do very well. It went up an average of 1.8% only. A lot of people lost interest in gold and it really ceased to be a major asset class that wasn't on the radar of, of investors anymore. But things changed again in 2007, 2008. We had the financial crisis. People started getting interested in gold again because they realized that counterparty risks, that banks can go bankrupt and it makes sense to own physical assets like gold and silver that cannot be defaulted on. But another interesting thing that happened in this period is that inflation almost disappeared. Um, part of the reason is dollar sterilization, where essentially a lot of inexpensive goods came from China. Globalization made uh, supply chains a lot more efficient and a lot of goods ended up being inexpensive. And that allowed central banks to keep interest rates very low. Essentially, all the time we were bouncing back between good growth and recession. And central banks, for the most part, tried to reduce interest rate to very low levels. In Europe, we went to negative interest rates, which were unheard of, uh, in order to try and keep some growth up. But nobody seemed to have any issue with inflation anymore. It was basically gone. And it was only by 2022 that inflation came back with a roar and if you watch the video about dollar sterilization you can see some of the reasons why this inflation came back and it caused uh, us to shift over into the overheating and the stagflationary quadrants uh, that's also when banks like silicon valley bank and so on ended up having to pay the price for buying these long-term bonds which would have been the right thing to buy in a recession, but they're one of the worst things you can buy uh, when when interest rates go up and inflation goes up. So that's essentially how precious metals and gold in particular will do very, very well if you're right in the right quadrants uh, or will be rather stagnant asset if you are in a quadrant like high growth when, when it's not the optimal time for gold.
uh, long term gold will always do well. Um, but on the short term, understanding these quietons will let you know when you should increase the allocation to things like gold and silver. And as we go into the inflationary period, that's when it's optimal for gold and silver. Gold and silver really aren't really seen as mainstream investments now, especially not silver. Um, but, you know, sophisticated entities are buying a lot of gold now. So if we take central banks, um, they have been net sellers of gold for a long period. But over the last few years, there has been a big impact of central banks buying a lot of gold. If you look at early 2023, for example, um, you will see Singapore has really doubled down on gold. Singapore has bought more gold than China. Um, China being the second one. Uh, Turkey. Turkey is grappling with a lot of inflation. They sort of messed up the monetary policy um, and the lira is just crashing. So they are buying gold because they know that is uh, a strong reserve currency that they're going to need. The Dutch National Bank uh, back in 2019, uh, they said it very clearly. Gold is the trust anchor of the financial system. If the whole system collapses, the gold stock provides a collateral to start over. Gold gives confidence in the power of the central bank's balance sheet. And if such a reset is going to occur, which happened many times in history, so it will happen at some point, you need something that people can trust, which is valuable, which is going to be there, which is not uh, counterparty risk, which is not dependent on somebody else's um, solvency or ability to do something. And that's always going to end up being gold and silver. It historically has been said for the last 5,000 years. And I think the Dutch Central Bank is summing that up. 